Well, fresh from his budget reply speech, the opposition, opposition, opposition leader joins me now. It's been a long week, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Laura. Um, Peter Dutton, uh, you gave a speech in uh, last month saying that uh, the next election will be one of the Coalition's finest hours, and you said you were determined more than ever to show Australians that we have listened to them and that we have learnt from past mistakes. What in the speech tonight will bring voters back to the Coalition or attract new ones? Well, Laura, firstly, uh, we're not quite to the 12-month mark, so I know the government wanted every policy that we're going to present in 2025 released tonight, but, of course, that was never going to be the case. We've got policies there which I think uh, will appeal to Australians who are really feeling dudded by the government. Uh, they're in a very difficult position financially, either in their small businesses or in their own family budget. Inflation, it seems, is sticky. I don't think the government's predictions, frankly, about interest rates coming down quickly is credible. And most economists are saying that this is an inflationary budget. So our offering tonight was to express our values, uh, reconfirmation of the issues that we think are important, particularly in response to the government's budget that they handed down on Tuesday night, and to provide some of that vision for our country's future. Well, that vision is largely the vision you took to the last election, uh, policies like uh, being able to use super to buy a house. You lost that election. When, when Labor lost its election, the election in 2019, it trashed its policies and started again. You're basically sticking with what you've got. But what are the policies in particular that you think you've put forward tonight which would help average Australians or middle Australians uh, with inflation? Well, for example, I think uh, it's important in a job market where you've got 438,000 vacancies and you have over 800,000 people on a job seeker payment that you provide more incentive for those people to be able to work part time. So our proposal to the government is that somebody in that scenario where they work 10 hours a fortnight, it means that they could be roughly about $350 better off uh, over the course of that fortnight. And it's similar to what we announced in the October budget, which wasn't a plan or a policy that we took to the 2022 election. That was for people on an age pension, veterans on a pension, who chose to work some extra hours, could do so, particularly in a tight labour market, keep more of that money without their pension being affected. And it's particularly important for people on fixed incomes where they've got increasing costs in their own household. And in a tight labour market, it is important to have labour available and people are able to go out and work if they choose to do so. There's more incentive in the system, whereas the government's provided more incentive for people to stay on welfare and not go into work. Well, uh, let's unpack that a little sure. bit. Um, first of all, you haven't actually said you will support the $40 a fortnight increase in JobSeeker. Do you intend to do that? Well, we'll wait to see uh, how the government responds to what I think we've constructively put forward tonight, because the proposal that, we're, that we've uh, put on the table tonight says that uh, somebody on an unemployment benefit could earn considerably more than $40 through 10 hours of work a fortnight, and that they could do that uh, in a, with a similar principle um, that the government adopted uh, off our recommendation, a policy I announced last June, uh, as I say, in relation to aged pensioners and veterans. So let's see how they respond to that, uh, and then we can make a decision once our party room's met uh, as to what our response will be. So it's not guaranteed that if they take up your suggestion you would necessarily uh, uh, in uh, support the increase in... Uh, look, income. Laura, I'm genuinely keen to work with the government here because as you move around the country, small businesses, businesses are screaming out for workers. Uh, there's a lot of lost productivity in our country, a lot of lost economic productivity because businesses just aren't working at their productive capacity. There are a lot of tourist operators, a lot of retail operators who are only operating at 60 or 70 per cent occupancy, not because they don't have a waiting list of people to come and stay at their hotel uh, or go into their restaurant, but because they can't get staff. And my argument is that if you allow people to work a little bit extra to get an understanding of the job market, the employer to get an understanding of their skills, then I think we can reduce the number of people on welfare benefits down. That's better for them. It gives them more disposable income. It helps the economy. Uh, and it helps those businesses as well. Most pictures of the long-term unemployed are basically people who've got significant barriers to entry, as they say. They might not have language skills. They, uh, they might have really big problems about getting into work because they just don't have basic you know, literacy, all those sorts of things. Um, one area that could potentially, uh, you know, in the submissions to the uh, employment paper, uh, be a, a help would be in areas like the aged care sector. Uh, don't we need sort of fairly specific policies to try to help people 
get in, get those basic skills which have just not existed for the last 15 or 20 years or certainly haven't been able to reduce long-term unemployment? Well, I, I, I just I challenge that because, I mean, if you look at the unemployment rate now, it's at a 50-year low. That didn't happen over the last 12 months. It happened after nine years of careful economic management under the coalition. And uh, the government's been bequeathed that, uh, uh, that low unemployment rate. Now, in a tight labour market, um, it, it is true that you find people who don't have a capacity uh, to work or limited capacity. Uh, some of those people move on to a disability support pension. But there are many measures. I mean, it's not 1980. There are many measures within the employment programs now that help people with all sorts of skills, uh, with... Uh, if English is not their first language, uh, if, the, if they need a, a licence for their job, uh, there are many ways in which you can help people uh, upskill and get into even a basic job. Uh, and my argument is that once people have got into that five or ten hours a fortnight, they've got an extra disposable income, they've got uh, a, an introduction to a potential full-time job or at least more hours uh, so that they can exit uh, welfare payments. And um, so I, I think there's a conversation there for us to have with the government and I hope that they don't just reject it outright, that we can have the conversation because I think it's in the individual's best interest but I think it's in our country's best interest as well. If I could take you back to your argument that this policy uh, you're proposing for uh, people on Job Seeker would be one that would help inflation, I'm still not sure how that would add to or improve the situation of middle Australia in dealing with the cost of living? Well, it can uh, firstly it improves productivity if people are working and they're generating income for themselves and income for the business that they're in. Uh, there's a productivity gain in that. It increases the participation rate in our country, uh, which is important. Uh, it also goes to, uh, to greater economic activity, particularly in a, in a tight labour market where there's upward pressure uh, on wages and if there is a limited supply of labour, uh, then that feeds into an inflationary environment. So uh, I think there are many elements uh, in that regard, but it was one of the a number of uh, measures that we spoke about tonight and that I think the government could work on to reduce inflation. But I do worry dreadfully at the moment for a lot of families. I, just, I think there's a lot of people underestimating how much pain is out there and how difficult... To, even families with two incomes who have got a high mortgage... Uh, were paying 1.79 on a fixed package with their bank and now paying, you know, 5% uh, higher than that. There, there are a lot of people who are really struggling at the moment and you see it in some of the retail figures or the downtrading that's taking place. Uh, and the government really didn't have any response to them at all in the budget. Well, you say in your speech that middle-income Australians won't receive one cent, mm -hmm. but that's not really true, is it? I mean, for starters, they'll get benefits via the changes in bulk billing, cheaper medicines and lower forecast energy prices and subsidies. Well, for a family uh, with a mortgage, three children, they're $25,000 worse off under Labor, not just because of their mortgages, but because they face a tax hike on the 1st of July. There are 126,000... Uh, sorry, there are 10 million Australians uh, on incomes of 126,000 or less this who, is, who this will... Is, this is a reference to the low and middle income tax it, offset? Yes, it is. And those... I mean, frankly, the Treasurer never mentioned it uh, in his budget uh, on Tuesday night. They, they pushed out the announcement uh, on the eve of Easter, trying to bury the, uh, the announcement. What and was the announcement? Because all that was, that was happening was that it was keeping the policy which your government had in place, which it was that it was going to end. But there, there are terminating measures all the time, Laura. I hear this argument from Labor, and it's a nonsense. There are many terminating me uh, measures that, that get refunded or they don't. This is the government's second budget. They've had the ability to... Re uh, to, to, to refund uh, some of the programs, uh, to continue them, to discontinue them. They took a decision to discontinue this, which means an effective tax rise uh, for 10 million Australians. They failed to mention it at all uh, in the budget speech on Tuesday night. And I think a lot of Australians are already feeling that pain and you're going to end up with a compounding of that pain come 1st of July. Well, just on tax, uh, a couple of other things. Uh, you haven't explicitly said whether the Coalition will support the proposed increase in the petroleum resource rent tax uh, or the superannuation tax changes, though you've been critical of both. What's your plan on those? Well, we'll have a chat to, uh, to the industry and, and to the economists to get an understanding of what impact that, uh, that will have. Uh, but obviously the government's uh, been working with the industry and I, I, don't, uh, I, I just don't want to see extra pressure on people's gas prices and electricity prices. Um, that's the sort of the starting point for us. Uh, I don't want there to be less gas into the system when consumers are demanding more because that just drives prices up further. 
and we'll, we'll consider that once we have the full detail. Um, you, um, sorry, uh, you haven't really proposed a significantly different budget bottom line um, to the one that Labor's proposing. What makes your plan less inflationary as a result? Well, in relation to uh, restoring a migration program, which is more in accord with uh, the long run average, I think the, uh, the economists have been very clear. If you bring in a million and a half people in a five year period in the current climate, where you have a housing crisis, where you have a rental crisis, where Australians are finding it difficult to rent a unit or a house at the moment, and you put a population bigger than the whole of Adelaide into the Australian population without proper planning. All of us are strongly in favour of a managed migration program. It's one of the great successes of our story, and we celebrate that story every day. But the fact is that the work hasn't been done. In this budget, the government's cutting infrastructure. And if you're sitting in congestion now, that gets worse if you bring in a million and a half people without there being uh, a widening of the roads or sure. so an in increase in the expenditure in public transport. But would you explicitly cut the migration program? I don't mean the permanent program. I mean, this is employer-driven migration, primarily in temporary migration, and, and students. What would you actually do to the migration program? We, we, we would assess the economic conditions at the time. and as Just now? Well, we're not in government now. No, so but, but we're, you're saying that the government should be doing something Well, we, we've... Uh, absolutely. Uh, and I think at a time when Australians can't buy a house, when Australians can't rent a property. I, I just asked the basic question today, and, and the government still can't answer it, where will these people live? Uh, I mean, just as, as, at a human level, I mean, where will people live if you've got 6,000 people a week on average coming in? And as uh, some forecasters have pointed out, the, the number of housing starts will fall. Uh, so at a time when you've got a tightness in the supply side of housing, uh, not to mention congestion, what happens in suburbs otherwise, uh, there's been no planning for it. And that's that's the problem. Uh, you need to, to plan properly so that you can provide for additional spaces at school, in particular communities. Uh, everybody's sitting in congestion going to work or picking the kids up from school now. And if you compound that, uh, th there needs to be proper planning to accommodate it. We're out of time, unfortunately, okay. but thanks so much for talking to us tonight. My pleasure. Thanks, Laura.